So in part one, we went through the three different stages, I guess you call it, on this transmitter. That is the power supply section, the RF section, which is going to make our 20, 30, 40 watts output, depending on uh, what kind of uh, DC current we use and what type of tubes we use. And then the actual modulator and modulation transformer that's going to produce the AM on 10 meters. Let me tell you, 10 meters is still acting great on uh, Solar Cycle 25. Even with all of the uh, solar activity we've had the last few weeks, the tremendous uh, auroras and uh, uh, ejections uh, from the sun, um, 10 meters has just been holding up beautifully. There was a G1 stationer in there. Uh, try it again. Whiskey Bravo 5, India. Romeo, India. Yeah, the Whiskey Bravo 5 station. This is Germany 8, Golf 8, November, Oscar, Florida. Waiting for his fire to warm up. This is G8 NOF, Central England, over. Yeah, George 8, uh, November, Oscar, Florida. Whiskey Bravo 5, India, Romeo, India, WB5, IRI. They had seemed a little weak uh, this morning. Uh, all that great, but... Uh, but you're uh, about an, an est, uh, well, guess an estimated S3 or 4, this receiver does not have an S meter, so, you know, uh, <laughs> let's just say I hear you in there. How about that? Uh, Golf 8, uh, November, Oscar, Florida, Whiskey, Bravo 5, India, uh, Romeo, India. Name is Doug, over. Yep, okay, Doug. Just waiting for my amplifier to warm. I'm only running. Lots of carrier. Even during uh, conditions where some of the other bands have been down, 10 meters has really been uh, doing a great job. And I've recorded uh, quite a bit of activity on 10 that uh, you guys might be interested in hearing. PC3 NWN KD7KK. Okay, Kim, got that down. Good signal. Lots of, lots of audio coming out for your signal there. Well modulated, I'd say. One, two, three. There we go. Now, my name is Bill Bravo India Lima Lima, and we're located uh, near Rapid City, South Dakota, here in the western part of the state, near uh, in the Black Hills, uh, near Mount Rushmore, about uh, 20 miles north of the famous Stone Faces. So, uh, right here is a concept G28 10 meter communicator, about 1963 vintage, oh, AM only. And that's what it was made for. Built-in vehicle, also squelch, uh, crystal control if you like, uh, all kind of good stuff on it. Have it for had it for many, many, many years, many, many years. So when you're playing with an unknown transformer, a power transformer like this with the leads cut off, whatever, a lot of times the wire colors will be faded, but do your best to figure out the wire colors and start drawing what you think is the schematic of the transformer and try to identify leads that look alike and group them together. You might have a couple of thick yellow leads. Those are probably the 5 volt winding. You might have green leads that are fairly thick. Um, those are probably the 6.3 or the 12.6 volts filament winding. You could have thinner wires such as thin green or thin yellow or thin red that are your high voltage leads. And you usually have a couple of black leads, maybe three, or it could be a dual primary, and those are typically the primary or the input to the transformer. When you do start to measure voltages on the transformer through your variac, there's another pitfall. And that is that all of these leads have leakage. That's right, it might be several megohms of leakage, but they have leakage. So a high impedance meter like a digital voltmeter might start to uh, show that you have voltage, for instance, between the 5 volt windings and the high voltage windings, which is very scary. But it may turn out that 
if you actually measure the impedance between those leads, you'll find that it's open. Now that's because it only takes a little bit of resistance to get a voltage reading on these voltmeters. A meter that won't lie to you as much as a lower impedance meter, such as a Simpson volt ohm meter or a Heathkit VTVM. These types of meters are not as high impedance and they won't lie to you about uh, voltages intermixing on the transformer. Of course, it's very possible that there is a short, an actual short, between windings, and you'll discover that soon enough. These transformers sometimes give you a little show before they blow up and uh, blow the fuse. Also, if you see cutoff leads like this, don't worry about that. You can extend those wires using heat shrink. I'm more concerned about the area very close to the transformer, where the wires might have gotten brittle, the insulation cracked, there could be other problems. You need to repair that before we do any of this work. That may mean shoving heat shrink down over each one of those leads individually. It may mean uh, adding RTV at that point uh, with a tie wrap to bring them all together in a nice neat bundle. Then fix them in place with, with RTV. As repaired and as safe before we even start any of this stuff. So we want to make sure that we don't have a short as we're assembling trying to use our vintage transformer in this circuit. So we want to make the transformer safe, we want to extend the leads, uh, we want to make sure that this old transformer is going to last a long time in amateur service. Remember, the television service is a 100% duty cycle, but most amateur service is only intermittent rated type service, and the transformer should last a whole lifetime. So if you don't want to use a surplus transformer or something that you've taken out of a, uh, a TV set and you want to buy new, there's certainly many, many transformers that give you these very common ratings. Uh, you don't need a transformer that puts out much more than 100 milliamps at 700 volts because really um, when you use the conventional it doubles the current. So we're going to be able to draw at least 200 milliamps out of this transformer. And the 6.3 volt output, anything over 3 amps should be adequate. And we're not actually using the 5 volt output. Uh, turns out I am using it, I'm rectifying it. And this is, should be something like a 1,000 to a 5,000 type of uh, filter capacitor on this. I neglected to put the value. We're just making 6 volts for any relays we might need. Uh, this is conventional capacitor input with a uh, Pi filter and for the uh, choke I'm using the primary of a small 24 volt 2 amp filament transformer leaving the secondary terminals open. Um, I've got some equalizing resistors on the capacitors to make sure they share the voltage nicely and I have a strong bleeder uh, with uh, kind of a center tap arrangement uh, I think that if you take 350 and multiply it by 1.414, you're going to end up close to 500 volts. It's something in the high 400s. Uh, by the time we're through this drop in, in the uh, choke and we load everything, this might end up being 450 to 470 volts. We also need a low voltage output for all of the low level stages and the screen grids. Uh, this will all be sorted out with series resistors to each stage off this tap. The 6.3 volt winding of course lights up the tubes. Uh, if that happens to have a center tap, just go ahead and ground it. If it doesn't, don't worry about it, you can float everything. But I'm using the 6.3 volt on another uh, transformer. This is a backward connected 24 to 120 volt transformer that's going to give me uh, my bias voltages. So I have a pair of uh, potentiometers, one to set the bias in the RF stage, one to set the bias in the audio modulator stage. So that's the whole shebang. That is the entire internal power supply. Very, very conventional looking. Let's move on to the VXO. So our variable crystal oscillator, our VXO, is based on a 14 MHz crystal or it could be a 7.25 MHz crystal. 
If it is a 7.25 megahertz crystal, you'll need to double in this stage. So I've given you the alternate output uh, that gives you the doubling to uh, 15 megahertz off the 7 megahertz rocks. If you're using a 15, uh, a 14 megahertz crystal, uh, you can just use a choke. You might even be able to get away with a resistor like a 47k resistor in this spot. But uh, this is a very conventional coal pits clap arrangement with a series tuned circuit that wiggles the crystal enough to get about 20 kilohertz of change by the time we get up to 10 meters. Safety. Safety first. Before I go any further and uh, accomplish the filament winding and start to actually assemble the, the guts of the transmitter, I've got a guard that I've put in. This guard gives you the idea that there might be something dangerous under there. Keeps tools and other things from accidentally falling into the power supply area. And at least it tries to keep your hands away from the high voltage. Of course that's impossible. Anytime you have the covers off something like this you're subject to high voltage. But having a guard is a safety measure that you can put uh, over your high voltage components and your AC input and all that stuff. Now it's uh, very close to the bottom of the chassis which is the right place to put it because once this thing gets tipped over you want all the heat from the resistors and bleeders and so on to go up. You don't want it to go down into the uh, into the ground where it can't escape. So the guard should remain very happy underneath the chassis. So I've got the filaments wired and I stuck in a few valves and it's time to see if things light up. I've got uh, all of the tubes except for the 6146 in line. Let's see what happens here. Kind of hard to see with this light. Let me turn this off. Oh yeah, I can see that the Motorola 6 CL6 is certainly lighting up. And I see the 12AX7. I see the miniature, which is our oscillator. I have replaced the transformer, as you can see. Everything's working fine. I retained the choke idea, but now it's a capacitor input filter with a conventional full wave hookup. That's the grounded center tap. And I'll be using a, a bleeder resistor tap to give me the various voltages and probably some series resistors to lower the voltage uh, gracefully through the, the different stages. So far I have the oscillator built. This is the variable crystal oscillator, the VXO. Looking at the counter, looks like uh, that will be doubled, of course. That, that's going to get us around 29.8, Okay, so just a little bit above 29. Let's tune it. Yeah. There it is, 2908 on the receiver. And we will tune this EXO by hand to start with. Let's see how high we can go here. Keep going. There's 10, so that should be up around 20, right? Okay. There's somebody on frequency. 10 is busy. And we can go up as high. Go up as high as 30, it looks like. Let's go to 30. Yep, we're up at 30. Okay, that's working pretty well. So it looks like uh, with the VXO, 
I can go from 2910, 29.01 to 29.03 with this VXO quite easily. So with this particular crystal I'm not able to go all the way down to 29.00 but that's the calling frequency and I like to avoid that anyway. So 29.01 uh, 10 kilohertz above that will be busy and 20 kilohertz will be busy and so on. So the next stage is the 6CL6 multiplier. And the 6CL6 multiplier tube is going to go in this socket right here. There will be a tuned circuit. That's going to be for next for the next video. But I have a stable power supply and I'm working on section 2, which is the RF chain. The next video will have the RF done and we'll be starting on the modulator.